Hello everyone. So in the last class we talked about Ethernet switching and we said that we can get larger and larger Ethernets by using these switches. So we had uh, let's say this is one particular Ethernet LAN and we could form a larger one with this switch by just connecting them together. And this was not the same as having one large single LAN where there were lots of potential collisions. Uh, and that was because this particular switch was intelligent. If a particular frame was meant for the same LAN, it would not forward it. So that way uh, collisions were reduced and uh, only, pack, only frames were forwarded if necessary. So that gave us some amount of scalability. But what if we want to go much beyond this? What if we want to have, let's say, millions of hosts connected together in a network? And that is something that I wanted to discuss today. So today's topic is going to be layer 3 switching. And this is going to be the key topic, uh, a key uh, ideas which uh, really give us a very large internet composed of uh, millions and even billions of different hosts connected together. So what are the problems with Ethernet switching? Why wouldn't it scale to like billions and billions of hosts all around the world let's say. So let's uh, think about it. So suppose we had uh, Let's, let's write that down. Let's talk about the shortcomings. Of Ethernet switching. So suppose we have uh, various switches. Let's say A, B, C and so on. something like this so these are all switches and let's say that there are lands over here so various different lands are connected together by these switches okay so over here we have machines connected So what I've shown here are the switches and these are all the hosts, uh, non-switch hosts I mean that are connected to these various LANs. And uh, we said that we are going to use a spanning tree protocol. So what we end up with is some sort of a tree. So let's say that these are the links used in the tree. This is A, B, C, uh, let's say D, E. Okay, so there is a spanning tree among all these switches. There are no loops anywhere, right? And uh, all of them are connected together. So that's fine, we've avoided loops. And uh, 
so let's think about it suppose c wanted to send a message to e so c wants to send a message to e it would have to take a path like this c b a d e So this is a very long path and uh, uh, you know suppose C wanted to talk directly to E so I'm just saying suppose there was a, a frame a data frame let's say somebody on this particular LAN for example this particular host wanted to send something to to E it would actually have to go through this particular path C B A D E whereas in fact actually if you look at this there's a much shorter path directly from C to E but we are going all the way around right so this path is not optimal so by optimal here I mean in terms of distance But we have to live with it because that is what this particular spanning tree is giving us. So uh, this this might be uh, not very good because uh, we are not using some links. Okay, so path is not optimal. We are not using some links. So the resource utilization may be poor. Okay, so what else is not great about Ethernet? So let's think about the forwarding tables over here. So any of these particular uh, uh, switches has, we know, a forwarding table which gives the port and the corresponding destination. So for a particular destination, each of them has to decide which port to forward okay so uh, we discussed it in two parts so we said first when you have a simple two line situation and you have a single switch in between them how how does the switch decide which port the different destination hosts are on right so it's intelligent it learns it over time and of course then we talked about the spanning tree protocol where we eliminate loop, uh, loops so what happens over there is first you have the spanning tree protocol and then you create after that you do have a learning procedure where you actually learn where different hosts are as they keep speaking okay so here too this is like one large LAN you can think about it connected by various switches and a few of the ports are going to be disabled right just so that you don't have loops so A would learn, in theory, it would learn about all these hosts, even though it has two ports, it would learn about all the hosts which are talking to each other over time, you know, you know depending on where the frames are going and so on. So you, it could have one entry for every host. So for every host in the LAN, all over, this entire large sized LAN, it will have an entry in its table and uh, let's say this is port 0 and port 1, it might have 0, 1, whatever, right? So the forwarding table is proportional to the number of hosts. If there are n hosts, then the size of the forwarding table is order of n. Now this is a big problem for something as large as the internet so suppose you have billions and billions of devices if every particular device every particular router in the internet had to have a forwarding table that large I mean it's going to be really hard to work with it so first of all in the old days I mean now maybe memory is much cheaper you know that you can have 
potentially large tables but in the old days that wasn't even possible right? we are talking about 20 30 uh, not 20 years we are talking about 30 40 years back right so order of n was not a good idea and even to look up such a table is non trivial right you would have to have a very fast lookup mechanism you would need more space for that you would need some sort of hashing or something like that for a fast lookup right so so you don't want your tables to grow like order of n so this sort of an order of n table where you have one entry for every host is called a is a resultant of what is called flat addressing So what is flat addressing? So suppose you think about the 48 address space, 48 bit address space. So we said this is the, the MAC addresses are chosen from here. Now what are going to be the addresses of the devices here in this Ethernet LAN? I mean, it, it depends the, from uh, which company are buying the network interface cards, the Ethernet cards are going to come from various devices, uh, various companies, and potentially it could be from any company. You know, nobody really cares. They, they just buy something in the market and plug it in. So as a result, you might see even in a small LAN, MAC addresses all over in this space. Even if you have like 10 devices, you might see something spread out around here. Okay. Of course, if you buy it from a single company, maybe it will have a smaller range, okay? But I mean, in general, I mean, you don't restrict somebody from, you know, buying from a particular company. So it could come from anywhere here, even if it's a small department land. So there is no, no method sort of to choose the addresses and uh, that is called flat addressing because really you're choosing it from anywhere in this address space, typically the, the MAC addresses. Uh, these are all the MAC addresses. There is no organization of these addresses of any kind, uh, some sort of an intelligent organization which would maybe help us reduce this particular table size. So this layer 2 routing in Ethernet is called flat addressing but uh, what is used in layer 3, so this, this is I'll just say layer 2, in layer 3 which is the IP addresses we use hierarchical addressing. And we'll see how that helps us reduce the size of the routing tables. Okay. So clearly here, uh, some of the issues that we've talked about is that the paths that you use are not optimal in any sense, in terms of any shortest path sense. We are also not using all the links efficiently. Then we added to this, we said that there is going to be a order of n uh, table size for forwarding and also we have to talk about stability so, that, so this I just put a fourth point here stability So here we have a very specific uh, tree which we have chosen. So this is the root. And what happens if the root goes down, let's think. You know? So I mean, suppose you have a very large network. I mean, you know, and uh, nodes, some particular, I mean, then you would expect switches to go down for some reason or the other, you know, maybe there was some software error or there was a power failure or something like that and a switch might go down so what if the root goes down then we have a problem 
because then one part of the network gets disconnected from the other even though there are links uh, let's say G could in theory send through C to D you know but if A is down this particular spanning tree is not functioning and frames will not get over here you know because some ports over here have been disabled okay. so if the root fails what do we do of course it's a practical problem which we have to solve okay so the spanning tree is reconstructed so how 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 do they know that they have to rerun the protocol okay, and uh, for that time in the standard method used in routing protocols is that you have some sort of keep alive messages so the root has to keep sending out messages periodically and if the other nodes don't hear that message from the root uh, you know then they would have to rerun the spanning tree protocol so, uh, right, so, okay, so, uh, the, so all of these issues, so I mean, the, even getting a spanning tree was non trivial, and Radia Perlman came up with a very elegant way of doing it using root ports and designated ports and so on. But getting the whole thing to work or well, taking into account practical problems is non trivial. Right, so you have to have other mechanisms. So we have uh, hello messages from the root. And if somebody doesn't hear these hello messages, then there is a problem somewhere in the tree. It could be the root itself is down or some, some other host, maybe a parent host in this, parent switch in this tree has failed. Right, and then they have to restart uh, the whole election process again. Okay. So let's just say that hello messages from root don't come, and that is when we do. That is when we reconstruct it. Okay. So this is an issue. I mean, if you have a very large tree then uh, some switch or the other is going to fail once in a while and then uh, other hosts other switches which don't hear this hello message they are going to uh, they are going to tell everybody else let's start the protocol again okay so i say let's say if the root or uh, other switch in the spanning tree fails okay due to which these hello messages don't reach then we have to reconstruct it okay so larger uh, lands are going to lead to more uh, frequent spanning tree construction So the spanning tree construction is not immediate, it's not instantaneous, right? it takes some time because there are different steps, they have to figure out which are my root ports, who is the root, what are the root ports, what are the designated ports, everything has to stabilize. So that could take uh, several seconds or uh, even minutes let's say in the worst case, depending on the size of the network and uh, communication is disrupted during that time. Okay, so Stability is a problem for large lands. Or let's just say large uh, spanning trees. Okay, so there are various issues with uh, this particular scheme that we are using for switching. Okay, so it achieves isolation of some lands from the others, but there are other issues that we have to deal with. Okay. 
So these are the shortcomings of Ethernet switching and we are going to see how layer 3 switching deals with these problems. Okay. So there were other issues too uh, which led to this particular layer 3 switching which was used at IP addresses and so on is that there was no common addressing scheme. Okay, so computers started out in the 1940s roughly, right, the modern electronic computers. And of course, people use them for very special purposes, right, and so they had these computers all over the place. You had a very particular specific task which you wanted to solve, right, and uh, people in different labs and so on had their own computers. and there wasn't so much of standardization that everybody had the same computers, right? So, so there was no common addressing scheme. Okay. Across the globe. At the time, you know, before the internet was created. So, maybe somebody is using this, uh, let's say, Ethernet, it has a particular addressing scheme, but some other people would have had another sort of computer system which had its own addressing scheme, you know, and they, uh, there, so there was no common addressing scheme and no common, let's say, communication protocols. across the globe okay, or at least across the United States where the internet started. Okay, so there were competitor uh, uh, sort of computer systems, France had its own scheme and so on but uh, due to some reason or the other the American scheme won out and currently the whole internet is based on the ARPANET. Okay. So this was another reason why people came up with IP addresses. Okay, so, so let's think about uh, how exactly the internet works. So, I'll describe it in this fashion. So, suppose you have some, let's say, LANs which are hooked up via these switches. Right? So, this is a small network, maybe a small academic institution. And now they want to connect to the internet. Okay. What it would look like is that uh, somewhere we would need a layer 3 switch. So this is let's say a layer 2 switch. This is a layer 3 switch. Okay. And by layer 3 I mean that it actually looks at the IP address in the messages being forwarded. And uh, it will forward based on the IP address. So a layer 2 switch is blind to IP addresses. So this is a layer 3 device and uh, let's say that this is going out to the internet. It's connecting this particular campus uh, to the internet. Okay, so maybe this is, let's say, a small academic institution, and uh, now it's this is its internet service provider. Let's say it is Reliance or some other company or the National Knowledge Network or something like that, right? Which and uh, here, of course, they have their own uh, layer 3 switch. And there is some network over here. It, so the actual choice of what is there within this network is up to the designer, I mean up to the owners of this network. And uh, that is why they are called autonomous systems.
so it's one of the reasons so whoever is running this network has the freedom to choose however many routers he wants over here okay so these layer 3 devices i'm going to call routers so this could be small or large depending upon the case and how they are connected to each other how many nodes are there and so on is up to the system administrator okay in addition the routing protocols used internally here uh, can be chosen arbitrarily by the people running this autonomous system so they can choose any internal routing protocol so that might be a bit surprising because we were talking about uh, no common protocols and so on right and that was an issue but now i'm saying that actually this a particular autonomous system can choose any routing protocol inside over here okay so clearly we'll have to have some sort of rules uh, so that i mean messages actually get from one end to the other you know because you can't choose routing protocols such that there are loops for example then then messages are not going to get anywhere okay. so let's say that we started out with this campus and uh, it's connected to an isp now here this this particular isp might also be connected to other autonomous systems okay so there are going to be routers here and uh, i'm just going to draw them as circles over here okay and so on right so these are various autonomous systems so each autonomous system chooses its internal routing protocol so this particular router wants to send a packet to this one it will take some particular path and that path is decided by the routing protocol chosen by whoever administers this the next guy could use something totally different a completely different routing protocol okay and it's up to him i mean he's free to do it independent of what this particular autonomous system uses okay so let's say that you had uh, let me just give them these particular routers names let's say this is a b c d e f g so an, as an example this one may choose shortest path in terms of number of hops so as its routing protocol maybe it gives us the shortest path in terms of number of hops okay and this one may choose a different criterion for example it may choose shortest path based on let's say latency so what i mean here is that you take the delay of uh, these links let's say you to look at only the speed of light propagation delay and based on that you find a shortest path right and maybe this is so let's say that a is sending a packet to g and it takes this particular path EFG. 
Okay, so A is sending a packet to G. It takes this path. Now this part of the path is optimal in one sense and this is optimal in a different sense. So there are different optimization criteria here. So this is interesting in the current internet because different autonomous systems are using their own optimal criteria for routing. The global routing is not optimal in any sense. A is sending a packet to G. Uh, I mean it's not choosing the shortest path in terms of number of hops or in latency or anything like that because each, each of them is using its own routing protocol. So the internet, uh, because of the way it was designed, doesn't give us optimal paths in any sense. Okay, so uh, that's interesting to and something to keep in mind. Okay, and of course people have been thinking how can we do things better, but it's not trivial to change the current internet. You can't tell somebody to just replace all the boxes, the millions of dollars he's invested in routers, and tell him to throw it out and put in some new protocol. Right, so, so we sort of have to live with what we have, right? Okay. So, in, we'll talk first about internal routing protocols. About how, uh, I mean, what are typical internal routing protocols chosen by the autonomous systems? And then uh, there's a second layer of routing across autonomous systems, which is uh, called interdomain routing. So, first of all, there is intra-domain. So this is the routing protocols within an autonomous system and interdomain routing that is routing pro protocols between autonomous systems. So interdomain the com the essentially the, the interdomain routing protocol which the internet uses is something called BGP which stands for border gateway protocol. So BGP is sort of the glue for the entire internet and uh, BGP is what allows us to have smaller routing tables. So we said that we don't, you know, we don't want order of n routing tables and BGP is what lets us get something much smaller than order of n. Right? And uh, uh, of course the internal routing protocols are still going to be order of n but n only corresponds to the number of uh, routers within an autonomous system so it's still not too bad okay but clearly we can't have an order of n uh, routing table where n is equal to the number of hosts in the entire internet okay? and that's what BGP helps us so okay so it's it's going to be tricky so first the straightforward thing is to look at these internal routing protocols and then we look at BGP and then we'll see how they really interact so BGP and the internal routing protocols have to work together after all. Okay, there's going to be a single routing table uh, which any particular router is going to look up you know, and going to forward packets. So it all has to work correctly and we have to ensure that there are no loops okay, just like we did in Ethernet. But at the same time we want to use all the links if possible, we want to be efficient, uh, we want it to be scalable and we want it to be also stable because uh, we saw that an Ethernet LAN which has too many switches is likely to be unstable. 
because we'd have to be, be forever recomputing the uh, spanning tree photo. Okay, so uh, this is like a bird's eye overview of what we will be studying in the next few lectures. So let us start with the intra domain routing. So, the intradomain routing protocols used today can be divided or classified into two types. One is called distance vector, and the other is called link state routing. So distance vector, the practical protocols using it, the most well-known one is called RIP, Routing Information Protocol. And a link state routing the well known ones are OSPF and ISIS, ISIS. So this stands for uh, open shortest path first. And ISIS stands for intermediate system to intermediate system. system to intermediate system. So these are the actual protocols with the nitty gritty details which are deployed in the current internet. Okay, and uh, so we will look at these at a more high level uh, looking at the protocols that they use. So all of these are going to try to find shortest paths in a particular graph. So given a graph, right, so you have some sort of a graph where each node is a router so each of these is a router what we have is that each link is given a particular weight So this acts as a cost and what we want to do is we want to route along the shortest path between any two pairs of nodes. Okay, so suppose this is A and this is B. These routing protocols are going to find the shortest path between them. And they're going to and if, if at all a packet is sent out by A and it has destination B, it is going to go on the shortest path, whatever it is. It may be maybe this particular path is the shortest path, so it would go along that path. Okay, so the routing protocol should be able to find the shortest paths and automatically each person just needs to look up his own routing table to forward the packet. And everything should work correctly so that there are no loops. So use shortest path and avoid loops. Okay, so the algorithms used by distance vector and link state routing you already know from your algorithms course, right? So it's, I mean, you've studied probably various shortest path algorithms and distance vector is based on the Bellman Ford algorithm and it uses, of course, a, dis a distributed version of that Bellman Ford. 
Okay, so there is no central node uh, which has all the information of the network. Okay, so but you can do something clever so that uh, even without that centralized information, the shortest paths can be discovered. Okay, so each particular so A doesn't actually have to know the full shortest path to B. I mean, he just has to know the next hop along that shortest path. So let's say that this is C D, and let's say that. Okay, let me just put some values here. Uh, so suppose, uh, okay, let's let me put nine here. So let's say that this is the shortest path. Okay, from A to B. So if you think about it, A is just looking up his forwarding table and deciding which is the next hop, whom to send it to next. So theoretically, A doesn't have to know the full path. I mean, A has to know that C is the next hop for sending this packet to B. C has to see that B is the destination and that, uh, let's say that this is E, that E is the next hop, right? And E has to figure out D and so on, right? And it has to reach the destination. So each person has to know only who is the next hop and as long as the protocol guarantees that then we are fine, the packet will actually go along the shortest path. Okay. So this has to be done so that we avoid loops. So the first, uh, let's, first set of protocols which we look at are based on distance vector. So let's begin with that. So what is the distance vector protocol? Let's take an example. A, C, D, B. So let's say that these are all routers. And let's say that the weights are all one. So the weights can be set by whoever is the system administrator. If he wants to give more priority for a link to be chosen on a shortest path, obviously he has to give a low, lower weight, right? Because the shortest path is going to take the path with the lowest overall weight. Okay. So how does this work? Initially, of course, each node uh, only knows about its, let's say about itself even, and uh, it sends out a message. Okay, but uh, and what will it say? It will say that I am A and my distance to myself is 0. Okay, so so it's going to send out a message saying that I am A and my so essentially it's going to send out IP addresses but we we'll just write it as A, B, C and so on and my distance to myself is zero and it hears A hears it will hear let's say B zero uh, F zero C zero and so on okay and uh, This is its forwarding table. So I'll just call it a routing table at A. So this is the destination and this is the next hop. Okay. So it's something similar to what we had in Ethernet. Okay, but here we are using IP addresses rather than MAC addresses. So after hearing these few messages, it knows that of course there is no next hop for A, but for B, C and F, it says the next hop is B, C and F. 
and in addition to that it has the cost so there is zero cost and bcf the cost is one okay, it, it heard that maybe this is configured into the router itself that these particular links that you are connected to have weight one So this is not enough to route a packet to D, let's say, I mean, uh, if, if B A gets a packet meant for D, it's going to drop it because after all, it doesn't have D as a destination. Okay. So uh, what, what is going to happen? So now after some time, F, B and C are going to send some more information to A. Okay, so let's see what happened a sends out certain information so it sends out to its own neighbors this is something to keep in mind it only sends out information to its own neighbors it doesn't broadcast this information and it's going to send out its whole table it's going to send out that i am connected to uh, i am a and uh, okay, so it's saying that I can, I am A, and uh, my distance to B is one, my distance to C is one, and my distance to F is one. Right, and it's telling its neighbors B, C, and F. This, this is all that it knows. And now it hears some more information from the others. So B has heard information from A, C and D, uh, sorry A and C and also F has heard from G okay, and C has heard from D, each of them has heard from its neighbors. So it hears from B, it hears that uh, I am connected to C with weight 1. Uh, this is my shortest distance. I am connected to A with distance 1. Right? And uh, it hears from C. It hears that I am connected to D with weight 1. I am connected to B with weight 1. And I am connected to uh, D with weight 1 ok so so what does this something like this mean it's saying that for this destination this is the best this is the current shortest path that I weight that I know this for this particular destination and this is the current shortest path uh, I know shortest path weight that I know ok so this is what this particular message means so clearly A is going to add some information now to its table so it has the destination and next hop and the cost So A, B, C, F, that was what was there originally. But now even information about D gets added and of course from F it gets some information. So F says that I am connected to A with weight 1, I am connected to G with weight 1, right? And uh, Right. Of course, I should have said that, I think I forgot about E here. E also has, okay, I had an E here. And the weight is 1. Okay, so you get the idea
and D the next stop is going to be C and here the next stop is going to be F right so for every particular host that you have here you have to look up from the new information you have what is going to be the shortest path who among your neighbors is closest to that particular destination okay so and you have to look at the total distance so what is my total distance to G so F has told me about G so my total distance is 1 plus 1 which is 2 and the next stop is going to be F because F told me that he was distance 1 away you know and that is the shortest path okay so F is the next hop and the wait here is 2 here 2 it is 2 everywhere else it is 1 okay except for this is a trivial case okay. so this is how it proceeds and uh, eventually of course uh, this this should converge and in fact right now already the table that I've written has the shortest path from A to everybody else okay so after some time B is going to tell A that I can my shortest path to D is 2 okay and uh, A sees that if I go through B to D then the path is going to be of length 3 which is greater than the path from A to C to D or A, I mean path to D through C so I don't really know the topology beyond C because C is not telling me what links are there C just says that I can reach D in one unit of weight okay so so A doesn't know the whole topology he only knows who are its immediate who are his immediate neighbors and he knows their distance to each of the neighbors distance shortest distances to all other destinations in the network okay and that is enough of him for him to choose who is the next stop and what is the total uh, shortest path weight to the destination okay so this is how it the distance vector proceeds so each particular uh, router is going to have its own routing table and uh, the protocol this particular algorithm works in such a way that indeed the shortest path would be used so if a sends a message to d he will look up his table and send it to c C will look up his shortest path, he will see what is his next stop and in that case it's going to be D directly. Okay. So why the protocol works and so on that you would have already studied in your algorithms course, why it does actually work out correctly. Right? So we will not go into those details uh, but let's see what happens if a link fails. So this is a practical issue which comes up. Now when a node fails uh, or even this particular link fails, so F gets to know that it cannot reach G. So it informs its neighbor in this case A and uh, if there were more neighbors it would inform all its neighbors that now it cannot reach G because in F's table in uh, in F stable there would have been an entry for G and the next hop would have been uh, well directly G right and the distance would be well, let's say 1 So F was advertising this particular uh, entry, it was saying that I was I could read G with distance 1 and that is no longer true because this link has failed. So it sends that information to the neighbor and so F says that uh, now my distance to G has become infinite. Okay. 
So what is A going to do? So A is going to look up its own table and it sees that I was able to read G through F and that's how I created this entry and my distance was 2 and now F says the distance is infinity. So what it's going to do after receiving that it's going to say that this is invalid This is after getting G infinity from uh, F. Okay. So what is it going to put? It will have to replace this by infinity. So it will say G uh, infinity and it will announce this to its neighbors so a thinks that i right now it thinks that i cannot read g because i was earlier going through f and f says that the distance has become infinity but of course the advertisements keep coming periodically so uh, after some time C is going to tell A that I have distance 2 to G so C tells A that I have distance 2 to G okay, and uh, of course it hears from the other neighbors too it will hear from let's say B it hears from B saying that it has a distance 3 to G and so on okay. but this one is clearly the sh shortest distance that it's heard of so it's going to include that in its routing table Okay, so, so eventually what's going to happen is that this gets replaced and uh, we have this distance here. Okay, so C says my distance to G is 2. So uh, A's distance through C to G is going to be 3. Okay, and so this is how the new routes are formed. Okay, and in, if, if A has a packet to send to G, it will now go through C. Okay. In the intermediate time, of course, A doesn't know how to read G. So if it gets a packet for G, it will just discard it because there's no entry in the routing table. Okay, so there may be situations where theoretically there is a path from one node to another, but because of this route, these routing updates, uh, possibly some particular node doesn't know the next hop for a particular destination, so it just drops packets. Okay. So, uh, the question is how long is all of this going to take, you know, we want it to be as quick as possible. So, for example, if this particular link fails, we don't want A to be sending thousands and thousands of packets meant for G this way. So, these protocols have uh, different types of updates. So, one is called a triggered update. where you update your neighbors about some particular event which has just occurred. So some event triggers a, a routing update. Two neighbors. And so for example, uh, FG fails, which triggers uh, an update from F to A.
so it essentially says g infinity to a So this is like an emergency, so you want to quickly tell people about it. Okay. And there are also periodic updates. Which, uh, for example, C is telling A what is uh, his distance to G and so on. Okay. So periodically they update the state of their outing tables and they tell uh, I mean they update what is the state of their outing tables and they tell that to uh, their neighbors so tell neighbors information in the routing table about uh, shortest paths, about let's say uh, destination and distance, right? So those are the two things which are shared in a distance vector protocol okay, to various destinations. Okay, so this is a simple enough protocol, the distance vector protocol and uh, all you do is you tell your neighbors, you give them this information, you tell them uh, this column, the set of destinations and the costs. Okay, this cost should correspond to the shortest distance you currently know to those various destinations. So these two columns are shared with your neighbors. So it is, this information is not broadcast in the entire network. So A doesn't share this information with everybody. It's not broadcast throughout. It is only shared with the immediate neighbors. So each neighbor does this. He just shares these two columns in the table with his neighbors and they keep updating their own routing tables and uh, everybody gets the shortest path or everybody at least get, gets to know the next neighbor in the shortest path to any particular destination. So there are some shortcomings of uh, this distance vector protocol which we'll study in the next lecture. But as you can imagine, no particular node knows the entire topology of the network. So A will not be able to reproduce this graph for us. Okay, whatever we see over here, A doesn't know. A just knows his uh, immediate neighbors and he knows the distance from these neighbors to various destinations. So because it doesn't have full topology information, what you could end up with is routing loops in certain peculiar situations. Okay, so we'll study that. So that is a shortcoming of distance vector protocols. But in small networks, you would uh, rarely expect those to be such a big problem. So in small networks, people do use distance vector protocol. But otherwise, they go for the other version, which is a link state protocol. And we'll study that too in a subsequent lecture.